Hello, this is Mr. Field and this is my video on biodiversity and material cycles. Now before you watch this video, make sure you're comfortable and confident with ecosystems and respiration. I've got videos on both of those things earlier in this playlist and also separated mixtures which appears in my chemistry playlist. Now in this video we will be looking at biodiversity human impacts on biodiversity, the water cycle, the carbon cycle, and the nitrogen cycle. So let's start by looking at what we mean by biodiversity. So biodiversity, broadly speaking, is about the number of different species living in an ecosystem. And really importantly, higher biodiversity is a good thing. And the reason why is because it makes ecosystems more resilient, because species depend on any one species less so what that means is um, if a species that you depend on suffers, there are others for you to fall back on because there are lots of different species in your biodiverse ecosystem. Now, it also helps to ensure that ecosystems can continue to provide the services that we depend on. You know, things like pest control, things like pollinating our crops, things like providing the oxygen that we need to breathe. All of those services are provided for us by ecosystems and the more biodiverse they are, the more resilient they are and therefore the more likely they are to continue providing those services for us. So it's really important that we help to maintain biodiversity and there are a couple of different things we can do that can really help to promote and improve biodiversity. Thing number one is reforestation. This is about planting trees in uh, on, on in areas that have previously had their tree cover, their forests removed. And um, this restores the habitats that thousands of species depend on. Once the trees return, all of the other living things, both plant, animal, bacteria, fungi, they will all return as well. Um, so reforestation is one of the most important things that we can do to improve biodiversity. Another thing we can do is conservation of animal species. For example, protecting endangered species using laws to make it illegal to kill them uh, or captive breeding and release of animals such as this cute little lemur here. And we, importantly, because of the way interdependence works, often by conserving just one species, many other species that also depend on it will also benefit. And so the biodiversity of the whole ecosystem can often be improved just by looking after one or two kind of key species. Now, OK, so now we're going to look at some of the negative impacts of humans on biodiversity. Thing number one is eutrophication. This is something that happens to uh, water sources like rivers um, and lakes and so on. Now, in this river, you can see a few things. You can see we've got fish swimming around in there. Brilliant. We've also got all these plants growing as well. Now, those plants depend on the light from the sun for photosynthesis and the light from the sun penetrates through the water and powers that photosynthesis and enables those plants to grow and develop a nice, healthy ecosystem in that river. Now, in eutrophication, the whole balance of that system gets um, messed up by human activities. So what happens is fertilizer is spread on farmers' fields by the farmer. Now, they do that for good reasons. It helps their crops to grow faster, which increases their yields, which means they can grow more food, and that makes food cheaper for us in the shops. So it's not a bad thing to use fertilizer, but it can have these bad effects. So the thing is, once they put that fertilizer on the fields, if it then rains, some of that fertilizer will be washed into the rivers. And when it gets into the rivers, it causes algae to rapidly grow. That's what this green slime is here uh, on the diagram. That algae really quickly grows. Um, and what it does is it blocks out the light to the plants growing on the riverbed. So if you see here, the, the sun's rays are no longer reaching the riverbed. So these plants on the riverbed will die. And when those plants die, bacteria will decompose the dead plants and that will consume oxygen which will kill the fish, see, up, upside down floating dead fish there. Um, so um, the, uh, the lack of oxygen will kill the fish and other water life. And so the whole ecosystem in the river can collapse because of the rapid growth of the fertilizer due to the, um, so the rapid growth of the algae due to the additional fertilizer. Another harmful impact on biodiversity can be caused by fish farming. Now, fish farming is where we, rather than catching fish from the wild in nets or using lines like that, we grow them in these giant, great big floating nets. 
um, often close to the shore uh, or in big lakes and things like that. Now, the problem with fish farming is that the fish must be fed large amounts of wild fish as food, which can reduce the wild fish populations. The amount of waste that they produce can trigger eutrophication because the waste acts a bit like fertiliser as well, causing lots of algae to grow, and that can really harm the surrounding um, uh, habitat. And finally, because there are large numbers of fish concentrated in one place, it makes disease more likely, and those diseases can often then spread to wild populations of fish as well. So fish farming, in some ways it's good because it means we have to catch less fish uh, in the wild. It does have these harmful effects as well. And the last um, important harm is about the introduction of what we call non-indigenous species. So these are species that have been moved from one ecosystem to another by human activities, sometimes on purpose, sometimes accidentally, but it often has really negative effects. So, for example, here we can see um, a cane toad. Now, cane toads were introduced to Australia from, I think, South America. Um, uh, you know, many decades ago to help control populations of pests like slugs and things on farmers' fields. Now, cane toads do eat slugs, you know, so that's a good idea. Unfortunately, there is nothing that lives wild in Australia that will eat cane toads because cane toads secrete a poisonous substance on their skin that will kill anything that tries to eat them. And so now these cane toads are really just kind of running out of control because often non-indigenous species have no natural predators or diseases which can cause major damage to ecosystems by you know removing the controls that would prevent one species from taking over next we've got the water cycle now we know that water is super important to life on earth and the water cycle is about the way that water moves between different stores on our planet so that we never actually run out of it it's constantly going round and round this water cycle now there are various different steps to the water cycle. Um, we're going to look at a simplified version. If you're taking GCSE geography, you'll have a more detailed version that you've learned there, but we don't need all the details. So step number one um, in the water cycle, it doesn't really matter where you start, but we're going to start um, in the oceans and lakes and rivers with the idea of evaporation. So um, water evaporates into the form of water vapor in the air. Now, as that water vapor rises upwards, it cools down and eventually it condenses to form clouds. So those clouds are made from trillions of, countless trillions of microscopic water droplets formed by the water vapour condensing. Now those clouds then blow over the land um, where they start to rise up and cool even further. And as they do that, eventually we get precipitation. So precipitation is the scientific word for rain, hail and snow. And so all the water in the clouds then starts to fall to the ground as rain or hail or snow. And it makes its way kind of through the ground, eventually into streams and then rivers in a process that we call surface runoff. Okay? And all that water in the streams eventually runs back to lakes and or the ocean to go back round the cycle again. There's also really importantly, plants play a very important role in the water cycle. So we have transpiration that we saw a few videos ago, um, whereby the roots of the plants suck up the water and then it evaporates out of their leaves and up into the air. And this is a major source of water vapor in the air, particularly when we get away from the, the coasts. So we've got those five stages, evaporation, condensation, precipitation, surface runoff, and transpiration. Now we're really lucky in this country um, to make possible water, which is drinking water, um, because we've got so much water very readily available, we just follow this short kind of three step process of sedimentation, filtration and chlorination. I won't go into this in detail, but you can check out the separating mixtures video uh, in my chemistry playlist if you want more detail. Now, in some countries, um, particularly those that experience drought or those that have very few uh, fresh water reserves, they have to make their drinking water by desalination of seawater that means removing the salt from seawater and they do that by distillation which you can see here so we take um, seawater and boil it to produce steam and they condense the steam back to pure water again there are more details on that in the separating mixtures um, video in my chemistry playlist now we've already seen how water cycles around the environment but carbon does the same thing as well. So we have what we call the carbon cycle. Now, this is super important because carbon is one of the most important elements uh, 
in, uh, in, in all living things. You know, all of the chemistry of living things is based on carbon. And so it's really important that we don't run out of carbon and that it's constantly cycled around our environment from store to store. Now, there's no start point on the carbon cycle, but we often think about the beginning as being carbon dioxide stored in the air. Now, if we remember, very roughly 0.04% of the air is carbon dioxide, um, but it plays a very important role, even though there's so little of it. Now, we start, or the, or the, the next stop, rather, is plants. So plants take carbon dioxide in from the atmosphere through photosynthesis and use it to build their bodies. Some of that carbon dioxide that is locked up in the form of glucose and cellulose and other carbohydrates, some of that gets released straight back as carbon dioxide by the plants through the process of respiration where glucose and oxygen combine together to form carbon dioxide and water. However, only a small proportion of the carbon gets released by plants back to carbon dioxide. Most of it remains locked up in their bodies. A lot of that then will be eaten by animals. So feeding transfers carbon from plants to animals. And then you will, uh, and, and animals also respire and will release much of the carbon that's locked up in the food they eat, will be breathed out in the form of carbon dioxide back into the air. So respiration is one of the main ways that the carbon dioxide in the air gets replaced. Now, animals will often be eaten by other animals, so carbon will be transferred from one animal to another by predation, and obviously they will respire as well, and that will transfer even more carbon back to the air as carbon dioxide. We also know that animals spend a lot of time going to the toilet, um, so they're excreting, uh, whether it's poop, you know, feces, or whether it's urine, wee, um, carbon will be coming out of their body in one form or another, and also Animals die as well, um, and their bodies will contain lots of carbon when they die. Now, what becomes of that carbon? Well, often their, their, their waste and their dead bodies will be broken down by decomposers. Now, decomposers are typically microorganisms like bacteria and fungi. And they will use those um, that, that waste as a source of energy and they will respire and much of the carbon in the in the waste and dead bodies that they've decomposed will go back into the air by respiration as carbon dioxide. However, in some situations, not all of the carbon in the um, in the waste and in the dead bodies gets decomposed and some of it ends up becoming fossil fuels like coal um, and uh, oil. And that would be the end of it. That would be carbon that was locked out of the carbon cycle for millions of years, were it not for the fact that we've got round to digging it up and burning it as a fuel. And so combustion is causing much more carbon dioxide to be released back into the atmosphere by burning the carbon that was locked up in the fossil fuels. This, as you will well know, is what's leading to global warming. That is our biggest environmental problem that we're facing right now. So that's the carbon cycle. Now, the last material we need to look at that is cycled around the environment is nitrogen. Now, nitrogen is a super important nutrient. Um, in the form of nitrate ions, it's a very important nutrient for plants. So nitrate ions are here, NO3 minus, and plants use nitrate ions to produce proteins. And that means that when animals eat the plants, they also get those proteins. And so ultimately, all the protein that we need is really coming from those nitrate ions that the plants absorb. So farmers, what they do is to, they aim to try and get more nitrates into the soil so that their plants can grow faster by producing proteins more quickly. So how do they do this? Well, they might spread fertilizer on their fields and those fertilizers often are made completely out of these nitrate ions or nitrate salts containing those nitrate ions and that enables their crops to grow much faster. Um, this is a really good thing because it can lead to more and cheaper food, but it can also lead to eutrophication if the farmers aren't careful about how they do it. Another way that farmers can get more nitrates into their soil is what we call crop rotation. So crop rotation involves, you know, let's imagine you've got a farmer with, with four fields. Rather than planting the same thing on the fields each year, they'll have four different crops and every year they'll move each crop to you know, one space around the rotation so that each field is growing something slightly different each year. 
And when they do that, they will often have one year where they make sure they're growing plants called um, legumes. Now, legumes are plants that contain these little nodules on their roots. And in those nodules, we've got bacteria called nitrogen fixing bacteria that can take in the nitrogen gas from the air and turn it into nitrates. So growing these um, legume plants is a natural way to get more nitrates into the soil. The types of plants that do this um, are th things like peas, beans and clover. And so farmers will often grow those as a natural way to increase the nitrates in their soil. Now this leads us on to the nitrogen cycle. So in the nitrogen cycle, we start by thinking about the main store of nitrogen in the environment, which is the air. 78% of the air that we breathe is made of nitrogen gas. The trouble is, although our plants really need it so they can start building proteins, they can't use the nitrogen gas on its own. It's just too unreactive. It's too stable. So we have to have a process called nitrogen fixation to turn the nitrogen into nitrates, the NO3 minus. Now, there are two main ways that happens. One is lightning. The very high temperatures from lightning um, are able to cause the nitrogen gas to react with oxygen and make those nitrate ions. So that's one way we can do it. The other way is bacteria um, that we, we just met on the previous slide, these nitrogen fixing bacteria that can take in nitrogen N2 and release as nitrate NO3 minus. Now, some of those nitrogen fixing bacteria live freely in the soil. Some of them live in the nodules of those legume plants um, like peas and beans and clover and things uh, like that. Now, once we've got nitrates in the soil, they can be absorbed by the roots of plants. So we have this absorption process and the plants can use them to build proteins. Now, as we know, plants will often be eaten by animals. And so that transfers the protein from the plant into the animal and enables it to grow. And obviously we know that animals will be eaten by other animals and so the protein can get transferred into them and so on. So once we've got um, once we've got the nitrate into the plants, they can build their proteins and then the nitrogen can stay in the animals through various different stages of feeding and um, predation and so on. Now, we also know that animals um, uh, pass waste, they excrete. So um, I've drawn uh, a, a big poo there, but actually really it's mostly, most the um, nitrogen actually leaves the body as urine. It was just hard to draw a decent looking picture of it. So that waste, animal waste containing the nitrogen and also the dead bodies of animals containing large amounts of nitrogen, they will be broken down by decomposers and converted into ammonia, NH3. Now the ammonia, the NH3, will be converted back into nitrate through a process called nitrification by another group of bacteria that live freely in the soil called nitrifying bacteria. So they take ammonia and turn it back into nitrate that can then be reabsorbed by other plants and it can go back around the cycle again. The last step in the nitrogen cycle is perhaps the least helpful one. So where we had nitrogen fixation, turning nitrogen into nitrates, there is another process called denitrification where some bacteria, perhaps quite annoyingly for us, some bacteria called denitrifying bacteria, they turn the nitrate back into nitrogen. Okay, so that's it. There is the nitrogen cycle. Quite a lot of detail here, so probably worth re-reading this or re-listening to this slide a couple of times. Okay, so that's it. The end. Well done if you got this far, and thank you for listening.